And good evening, Living Hope Community Church. What a great privilege it is for us to gather again to look into God's Word. I hope you had a wonderful Wednesday today. We're here in Colossians chapter 3 tonight, looking at something that I think of. It's just an amazing passage when you think about what's happening in our world today. You know, there's a lot of churches out there that say the way to witness to the community of unbelievers is to be more and more like them, adopt their style, adopt their music, adopt all the things that would make them feel very comfortable. Well, the Bible sort of pulls us away from that. Are we, are we to witness and be friends and love? And yes, we're to do all that, but the real power of the witness comes through the transformation God does in our lives. And that's what we're going to see tonight. It's a fascinating passage. I invite you to open your Bibles to Colossians 3. Um, And as you do so, let me just remind you of one thing by way of announcement this evening. That is um, next Wednesday night, the first Wednesday night of every month, we have the Issues and Answers uh, Forum. If you have an issue, uh, I'd like you to email it to me, Pastor Scott at welcometolivinghope.com, or if you want to leave it in the comment section below, That would be great too, but we will divert a little bit next week from Colossians to answer your questions and to have that time together. Um, As we prepare our hearts for the Bible study tonight, I'd just like to pray with you. Let's pray together. Father, you are Lord of all. You know us from the inside out. Lord, you've done all to save us, and we come before you. We thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his sacrifice We ask you, Lord, to allow your truth to enter our hearts tonight, not just so we know some more facts, but so that we obey, so that we live in a way that honors you. Forgive us for our sin and cleanse us as we open the book and bring the light of your truth to bear in our hearts that we might be changed in how we think and therefore changed in how we talk and what we do. Glorify your name in this time, I pray in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. So off we go to Colossians 3. Here's Paul talking to us again as he writes to the church at Colossae. And he says, If then you have been raised with Christ, which we'll talk about that a little more in a second, but here's what he's asking us to do. Seek the things that are above. This word seek, it's a it's a present active verb. It means keep on seeking, keep on, that this is a lifelong process that you and I are to pursue from the moment we meet Jesus Christ by faith all the way to the end of our lives. We seek the things that are above. Just think about the command here. What are we focused on in our lives? Many of us are focused on um, you know, our jobs, our, our money situation, our health situation. We're pursuing various streams of income. We're, we're pursuing various pleasures in life, entertaining ourselves in sporting events or, or going on vacation to fabulous places or whatever. What are we seeking out of life? The simple command of verse 1 in Colossians 3 is, I want you to seek the things that are above. If you're in Christ, if you've been raised with Christ, in other words, if God has come into your heart through your faith in Jesus Christ and changed your position in life from somebody that walked in the darkness to now somebody that walks in the light, change your goals. Change your whole approach to life. Seek the things that are above where Christ is. He's our Lord. He's our Savior. He's the one we love. He's the one we serve. He's the one that we obey, right? We seek what he wants. He's seated at the right hand of God. So let's just break this down for a second and look a little more at if then you have been raised with Christ. Let me take you back in Colossians to chapter 2. You remember this, I hope having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. You, 
who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Who? Jesus. Together with Jesus. Having forgiven us all our trespasses, we are told that our position in God's heart has changed. We used to be objects of wrath. We used to be people destined to pay for our sinful lives, for our disobedience before God. But God sent his son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross. Through that death, God punished sin as he poured his wrath out on Jesus, as Jesus was sacrificed as the Lamb of God on the cross. Jesus died. He rose again, confirming God's plan of salvation, confirming that death has been conquered. And he places his righteousness on us as we bow before him and receive him by faith. And God changes us from from people that are going to be punished for our sin to people that are in his family. He has he has let us in our flesh die to ourselves and raised us to new life with Jesus. You know, a lot of us don't see ourselves like that, although scripture tells us these things over and over and over again. A lot of us lose track of what's clearly defined for us in Scripture. Well, here we see it. We saw it when we studied Colossians 2. If you remember, God has made us alive together with Jesus. When you think about the fact of your life, believer, you are now raised with Christ. You say, I don't feel very raised. I still have bill problems. I still have health problems. My kids are still a mess. I don't feel very raised. Well, just understand that from God's perspective, we have been pulled out of the kingdom of darkness, placed into the kingdom of light. We now belong to him. Praise his glorious and holy name. Isn't that a wonderful gift he's given us? So we think about this verse, seek the things that are above if you've been raised with Christ. So this is specifically coming to us as believers. But how do we seek the things that are above? Well, Jesus talked about this in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 when he said, But seek first the kingdom of God, and he adds this, look, and his righteousness. Now he's talking about the necessities of life and all these things will be added to you. But keep in mind that our journey with Jesus Christ is not just about, I want to go to heaven. God will bring us to himself. But our journey in relationship with Jesus Christ, abiding in him and serving him, is about that daily walk with him that's manifested through obedience in our hearts and in our behavior to the Lord. We are to seek him. We are to seek his righteousness. What does he say? He says, if you seek me, you're going to find me. If you draw close to me, I'm going to draw close to you. Uh, that's in James. It's, it's so vital Beloved, that you set aside a time in your day to seek the Lord, that you have the attitude of wanting to know more. In fact, to not have that, let me just take you to Romans for a second and show you this. But for those who are self-seeking, that's kind of like where we live, right? The iPhones, the iPads, the I, 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 everything. We want what we want when we want it just because we want it. For those who are self-seeking, and how do they manifest the fact that they're selfishly living for themselves? They do not obey the truth. Do you see that? They don't yield themselves to Jesus. They're not seeking things that are above. They're seeking their self-satisfaction and pleasure on this earth. And they don't obey the truth. They're not going to yield their hearts to God and do what God says. What happens? But they obey unrighteousness. In other words, they live for their own pleasure for the moment. They're, they're checking off their bucket list because they have no regard with, for what God wants for their lives. What's going to happen to them? Look at the end of verse 8 in Romans chapter 2. There will be wrath and fury. What does that mean? Well, that means that God's going to bring judgment. I know that's very unpopular in our modern culture. But God is going to punish sin. And if we're not in Christ, we're going to pay our own own debt to him for the disobedience that we've manifested in our lives. That's why it's so vital to be in Christ. When we're told there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, 
It's not about I can be good enough for God. It's not about my credit column, morally speaking. I've done more good deeds than my debit column, more, morally speaking, than the bad deeds I've done. I balance positive. God's going to let me in. No, it's about the fact that you and I are going to be subject to the wrath and fury of God if we have not yielded our hearts to Jesus Christ by faith. Because it's only in Christ that we receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's only then that we're covered so that we escape the judgment of God, not because we're good, but because the Lord Jesus himself has put his righteousness on us. We belong to him. That's, that's how we get raised with Christ. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you have that hope. You don't want to be self-seeking. You don't want to be self-righteous. You don't want to be somebody that doesn't obey the truth. You want to be somebody that escapes wrath and fury through understanding and obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. That's so vital for our modern culture. Listen to this. When it tells us to seek things that are above, I just want to spend a minute here and help you see that Instead of getting into our culture and being like our culture and being relatable, it's, it's not that you can't be relatable. Paul says, you know, to the Jews, I became like the Jews. To the Gentiles, I became like the Gentiles. I did all these things so I might save some. Yeah, okay, so we do want to relate. We do want to love. But in terms of allowing the church to adopt the practices of the world and call it normative, This is something the Bible rejects categorically. You and I are called to holiness. We're called to holiness before we're called to happiness. (laughs) We're called to living God's truth out, to seek the things that are above. This is about a total change. Do you remember Romans 12, 1? Paul's just presented the gospel for the last 11 chapters, a beautiful summary an explanation of what it means to escape the wrath of God, what it means to be justified through faith in Jesus Christ, how he did satisfy the justice of God on the cross, how our sin has been punished, how we have died with him and risen again with him through faith as he's filled us with his spirit. I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful section of scripture. I recommend it to you highly, Romans 1 through 11. Just read it for yourself. But when he gets to 12, he's going to explain the applications to us. And here he starts. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers. In other words, I urge you, if you don't get anything else, get this. By the mercies of God, because God has done all this for us, what does he want us to do? To present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? I die to myself. I die to my agenda. I die to my bucket list, to put it in modern terms. I instead say, Lord, I belong to you. How do you want me to live? Where do you want me to go? Well, God says, look, I want you to be holy. I want you to live in a way that obeys me, that honors me. I want you to be acceptable. I want you to look at my word and obey me. Remember when Jesus was teaching us how to make disciples, he said in Matthew 28, teach them to obey everything I've commanded. That means you and I have to learn what he's commanded with the heartfelt desire to obey what he's commanded. We are subject to him. We submit ourselves to his word. And what does God call that when we live in that way? He calls that worship. You see this? Which is your spiritual worship. You are worshiping God the way God wants to be worshipped when you present your body to him as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. When you bring yourself to him and say, Lord, I belong to you. That's how I seek the things that are above. That's the first step. I believe and I surrender my life to you. And as this passage in Romans 12 moves forward, don't forget, well, we'll get to it in a second. The next thing Paul brings up in Colossians 3, set your minds on things above, not on things that are on earth. What's he saying? He's saying, okay, change how you think. You're all involved in thinking about how to get along in this world and how to function and how to survive and what to do. I want you to start thinking differently. 
I want you to start thinking on what God has said about where he lives, where he's taking us to live, how he's coming back for us. I want you to start setting your mind on the hope that is given to every believer through Scripture in what Jesus is doing and will do on our behalf if we've surrendered our lives to him. Start thinking about those things. Don't let your mind get set on things of this world. Set your mind. What does that mean? Deliberately think godly thoughts. It's not very complicated, but you understand that your thought life determines your behavior. Your thought life, the the things we do start with what we think about. Paul's saying, look, I want you to live well. If you've been raised with Christ, I want you to seek the things that are above. And if you're seeking the things that that are above, one of the ways to do that is get your mind right. Look at your Bible and understand the promises God has made to you. Hold on to them. Set your minds on things that are above. While we might say to the world, oh, we need to adopt your practices to help you understand Jesus is the Christ. In fact, we're not even going to tell you about Jesus when you first come to church. We're going to entertain you, and we're going to make it really fun so that, you know, you want to come back. We're going to have the best band and the nicest smoke machine, and we're going to have jokes and stories from the pulpit. We're not going to hit the Bible too hard. Instead, we're going to wait. Because once you get involved, we're going to get you in a little small group. And in that small group, we have trained leadership that's going to try to help you understand the message of the Bible. That's not how Colossians reads. If we want to serve God in faithfulness, what do we do? Well, we seek the things that are above. In other words, instead of trying to adopt the customs of our world, We try to adopt God's customs, God's truth. Instead of thinking about how we can have a happy life here, we think about what God wants for us, who he is, what he's promised. We set our hearts on the things that are above. And we're specifically told not on things that are on earth. You know, maybe that second television, that third television, that second car, maybe maybe we don't really need those things. Maybe we can... Donate those funds to serving Christ in some way. Maybe we should temper our lifestyle with the knowledge that we're just here for a visit. We should be thinking about who the Lord is and what he's promised and pursue that with our whole hearts. Is that what God's telling us here? I think the answer to that is yes, absolutely. In fact, when you think about changing your mind, now I'll take you to Romans chapter 2, or 12 verse 2, I mean. Do not be conformed to this world. There it is again. We're here for a visit. We belong to Jesus Christ. We've been raised with Christ. We're going to seek the things that are above. We're going to set our minds on the things that are above. Why? Because that's God's heart for us. And God has already made that transformation through how he sees us in Christ He's already made that transformation in us. Don't be conformed to this world. Well, we still need a place to live. We still need to wear clothes and go to the grocery store. I mean, we have to be conformed in certain ways. But in terms of buying into the world system, that's not for us. We buy into the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. We buy into the fact that we're going to set our thinking on him. We're going to seek him and what he wants. And he's going to lead our lives. That's what Paul's saying here. Don't be conformed to this world. How am I supposed to change? But be transformed by the renewal of your mind. There it is again. Stop thinking earthly thoughts and start thinking heavenly thoughts. Stop focusing on the nuts and bolts of life here and start focusing on the promises of the Lord. I've heard so many people say, well, he's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. But I I hear this as well from Scripture. Be heavenly minded. You can still be earthly good. (laughs) You can still serve others, love others, provide, do whatever you can to love your neighbor as yourself. But the mental game is very important. 
Keep your mind set on things above. Keep your heart after who God is. Seek him. Pursue him constantly, nonstop. That's the call. Let your mind be renewed by the truth of God, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God. In other words, you're going to understand what God wants the more you allow God to renew your mind through his truth, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. This is the call of Scripture upon us. If we've been raised with Christ, we need to seek the things that are above. We need to set our minds on the things that are above. In fact, one more I'll just show you in practice as Paul addresses the Philippian church. What does he say? Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, what? You see that? Think about these things. Set your mind on things above. Don't allow yourself to get swallowed up in the details of the life you live with, without realizing you belong to Jesus Christ if you've come to him by faith. Hold on to him. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. It's like in verse 9, he's telling us to seek those things. Practice these things. And in verse 8, he's telling us what he said in Colossians 3, 2, set your mind on things above. Think about these things, not about things that are on the earth. Do these things. This is where the blessing of God lives. Okay, so let's go back to Colossians 3. Why should we live like this? Well, look at this. For you have died. You say, I have? I feel like I'm still here. What are you talking about? I've died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. Do you understand when the Bible says, look, you've died? That the Bible is pushing every one of us who's received Jesus Christ to the realization that we are now hidden with him. We are his. We are no longer just regular people walking this earth, even though we look like it from the outside. From the inside, God has made a transformation. He has filled us with his spirit. We have been forgiven. Our record of debt against the Lord has been canceled. We saw that last week in chapter 2. Marvelous truth. You've died. Why would we want to live in this sin-soaked world and not acknowledge that God has brought us out? Why would we want to participate with the evil all around us? God's saying, look, I want you to be holy. I'm holy. I want you to step away from these things that lead you to sin against me. I want you to walk in purity before me. Why? Because I've performed this action in your soul. You've died. You've died. Your life, you still have life. Look at that. You're hidden with Christ in God. Now you've been brought into the family. You're adopted into the family. Act like it. Live like it. Set your mind on things above. Seek the things that are above. That's the call of tonight's passage. I hope you're getting this. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that profound? And just think about that. Let's pursue that for a minute. For you have died. Okay, what does that mean? Well, look at this. In Romans 6, we read this. By no means. He's just asked the question, should we continue to sin uh, since we've been forgiven? And, he's, and he tells us, by no means. No, you don't continue on in sin. How can we who died to sin still live in it? This is the work God has done in us. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? This isn't necessarily talking about being dunked in the water. This is talking about the process of conversion. When we came to Jesus Christ, we died to ourselves. What does he say? You know, if you want to seek me, what do you do? Well, you deny yourself. That's the first thing he says. You take up your cross. What does that mean? A cross is not not jewelry in the ancient world. It's not a necklace or some earrings. No, a cross in the ancient world is about death. Take up your cross. Be ready to die. Give me your life and follow me right? Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow me. These are the things Jesus emphasizes 
over and over and over again. We've been baptized into his death. In other words, from God's perspective, church, we all who believe in Jesus are called to follow him in truth and to give up what this world has to offer. Profound truth for us. Here it is explained a little more fully in verse 4. We were buried therefore with him. How much clearer can that be? When you surrendered your life to Jesus, it wasn't about, oh, I want to go to heaven. It was about, I'm surrendering my life to the living Lord Jesus. I'm his. I'm under new management. I belong to him now. I've been buried with him. The old is gone. The new has come. I'm a new creation. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Why? In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we might, we too might, what? Walk in newness of life. Notice at the end of verse 4, it doesn't say, we too might go to heaven someday. No. He emphasizes what? We need to walk in newness of life now. That's what he's telling us. That's what he's telling us. You remember in Galatians, when Paul was talking about his own life, he said, I have been crucified with Christ. Well, he wasn't up there on a cross next to Jesus, was he? No, but he's telling us he died. It is no longer I who live. What does that mean? That means I died. But Christ who lives in me, I've been a participant in the transformation God has done in my life through faith in Jesus Christ. My goal in life now is to seek the things that are above. My goal in life now is to set my mind on the things that are above. Christ lives in me now. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you see the transformation? One more. Let's just think about it together. When it says, your life is hidden with Christ. Here in verse 4, it's so important for us to get this. What does that mean? I take you to Ephesians 1 and just, just absorb this if you can. In him, in who? Jesus. You also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed. Okay, there it is. I listen to what God reveals through his word, and I believe that what he says is true. What happens? You were sealed with the promise Holy Spirit. Our life in the modern world looks the same. But in the eyes of God, we've been brought into Christ. We've been sealed through his spirit. We belong to him. Our citizenship is in heaven. No matter what it looks like on the outside, we're just passing through this life. We can't wait for the Lord to come. Why? Because he's going to fulfill his promises to us. We know him. We love him. This is the call of the gospel. In fact, this is what will attract people to come to know Jesus Christ. It's not about, gee, your band is better than the band I saw at the rock concert on Saturday night. I guess I'll start coming to church. No. No. God's heart is to say, look, let me transform your life from the inside out. Let me bring you to faith. And when you come to faith, let me seal you in Christ with my spirit. Let me put the righteousness of Jesus Christ on you so that I see you through the lens of his perfection and you escape my judgment. Let me hide you in Christ. Well, back to Colossians 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears. There it is. I'm dead to myself, right? I've died. Well, then how am I alive? Christ is my life. He is my life. Okay, that's what it's saying. And he's coming back, right? He's coming back when, it, when he appears, it says. Then what's going to happen to us? Then you also will appear with him in glory. Why do we suffer ostracism? Why do we suffer the pains that we go through to stand up for the truth in this dark world we live in? We're that shining light by God's own design. We we're the salt of the earth as he's declared us to be through the power of his spirit, through the truth of his word. How do we handle all the rejection that brings us? We remember the promise. Do you see this? He's coming back. He is our life now. He is our life forevermore. And when he does come back, what's going to happen? 
we will appear with him in glory. No more death, no more crying, no more lying, no more sin. We'll be with him forever in glorified bodies. This is the promise of the word of God. And God can't lie. God never breaks his promise. Just think about this with me, church. Remember when we were back in chapter 2, I just want to refresh you. And you who were dead in your trespasses. Okay, we used to be dead because of our sin and the uncircumcision of our flesh. We didn't want anything to do with God. What happened? God made us alive together with him. We were dead. God made us alive together with him. Do you remember when we studied this verse? God has totally revolutionized us from the inside out. And what does that mean for us? Well, he's forgiven us all our trespasses. If you're watching this tonight and you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you haven't been forgiven, tonight's the night for you to bow your heart before the Lord and ask him at to save you. Ask him for forgiveness. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ to enter your heart. Surrender your life to him. You're dead in your trespasses right now, but through that simple prayer and the power of God, you can be made alive together with Christ, as we just see in this verse in chapter 2. He's forgiven us all our trespasses. What did he do? He canceled the record of debt. He canceled the record. There's no more evidence that we're guilty. It's been canceled. Why? Because our debt's been paid. He canceled the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. How did he do it? This he set aside by nailing it to the cross. That's the glory of the plan of salvation. We are brought to him through faith and forgiven by his glorious, glorious mercy to us. Praise God. I just want to think about how we will appear with him in glory. Um, that phrase we saw uh, in verse 4. Think about this. The print's a little small. I apologize, but I hope you can follow it. We're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. And then watch. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. You remember the Bible says over and over that every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess. You have an opportunity to be saved from the wrath of God right now by coming to Jesus Christ by faith. If you refuse that opportunity, then you will have this experience. The Lord himself will inflict vengeance on those who don't know God, who will refuse to surrender. He's going to inflict vengeance on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. But for those of us that do, a promise is coming. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Okay, that means hell, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. That's a terrible day for those that don't surrender. And when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. He is bringing us to himself. He's coming for us. We will be people that marvel at him because why? We have believed. What a glorious truth. So now, what are we supposed to do with this? Uh, we're supposed to seek the things that are above. We're supposed to set our minds on the things that are above. But how does that play out in everyday life? Well, in the next verse in Colossians 3, Paul brings it to us. He says what? Put to death, therefore. Oh, I thought I already was dead in Christ. Yeah, through God's lens, as God views us, we are. But through our sinful natures, we still have these tendencies to rebel against God. And what, are, what is our instruction here? Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. In other words, that sinful nature. In fact, Paul is now going to spell it out for us in case we couldn't figure it out. Sexual immorality, that's a word porneia. We get the word pornography from it. Paul instructs us as followers of Jesus Christ, as people that want to set our minds on things above, as people that want to seek the things that are above, Monitor your behavior. 
monitor what you do. Seek the Lord's strength. If you're addicted to pornography today, it's not the end of the world. God's willing to forgive, and God is willing to give you the strength to forsake that addiction. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity. That's just all kinds of slanderous sin, all kinds of evil desire, passion, uh, evil desire. Look at this. I, <laughs> I find this so fascinating. The Bible just says, hey, cut it out. You know, we say, well, I need all these programs. I need to go to these meetings. I need to have a sponsor. God says, look, if you're in me and my spirit's in you, if you belong to me, what you need to do is pray, ask me for my strength, and flee the temptation. Demonstrate your sincerity to walk in the light, even as I'm in the light, by resisting the devil. He will flee from you when the temptation comes. God will give you the strength to survive it. When you fall, what do you do? You repent and you get back up. That's what we're told to do. Put to death what's earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness. I just want more and more and more and more and more, which is idolatry. We're not serving what God wants. We're serving what we want. And as Paul ends this little section for us tonight, he says, look, it's because of these things the wrath of God is coming. We seem to think that God loves us so much that he's never going to respond to our evil. We see the example of Sodom and Gomorrah. We see the example of Noah and God wiping out the world because of its evil. And yet we refuse to think that God is going to respond to our evil. As if, you know, he's going to dig up Sodom and Gomorrah and apologize to them because he's going to tolerate how we live. God says, look, my moral law is the law. You can disobey it if you want. But when you do so, you're heaping up wrath for yourself. You're incurring greater and greater judgment. You can read about it in Romans 2. On account of these behaviors, what happens? God's anger against sin gets more and more animated. His judgment is closer and closer. I fear so greatly for our country because we've just thrown God out the window. You can't take a Bible to school. Well, you can have one in prison after your life is ruined through whatever evil crime you committed or whatever addiction got you to jail. Then you can read your Bible. Our culture says it's okay then. Then you can go to chapel and listen to a preacher talk about God. But you better not have it in school because we don't want you contaminated by God's truth. Are you kidding me? Uh, we're that nation that calls evil good and calls good evil. And we are inciting the judgment of God. That's what's coming. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Did you understand this one thing? I, I'm going to quit with this. The wrath of God is coming, it says here. But I want you to see something. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. Romans 5, 9. What does it mean? God has saved us from the penalty of our sin by punishing Jesus in his death on the cross. That's what it means. We have now been justified by his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him. You know, we talk about being saved a lot, right? Saved by him from what? From our bad habits, from our bad decisions, from our bad choices, from... Uh, our unhappy marriages or our small bank accounts, what are we going to be saved from? Here it says that we're going to be saved by him, by Jesus, from the wrath of God. Do you understand that salvation is about being saved from God? When God brings his judgment against sin to bear on what the Bible calls the day of the Lord, there's going to be only two groups of people. One group that has come to Jesus Christ by faith, obeyed God's word, been filled with his spirit, and that group of people is anxiously anticipating the arrival of the Messiah for the second time, to worship and adore him, to marvel at him, to be his forevermore. The other group of people has constantly refused. God, I know uh, you're calling me to surrender myself to you, but no. That's just stupid, God. I'm not going to do that. What does it say? The message of the cross is foolishness to the people that don't believe. I mean, 
I will not come to you, God. I will not live in your ways. I will not believe in Jesus. What happens? The Bible is so clear. The wrath of God happens against that sin. If we come to Jesus Christ, we're saved by him from the wrath of God. If we don't, we're going to experience the full wrath of God. So remember, we see these things. We're to seek things that are above. We're to set our minds on the things that are above, not of this world. Not on the things of this world. We're supposed to remember that we've we've died with him. We're hidden with Christ in him. We're supposed to remember that Jesus Christ is going to appear again and that when he appears, we will appear with him. We'll be glorified with him. We'll be with him in glory. I mean, if that's not a promise to make your day, I don't know what you need. That's a fantastic truth. God is telling us, put to death these things that I hate, these behaviors that are absolutely contrary to walking in the light, to being holy. Put those things to death. Put those things to death. I trust, church, that you think about these things, that you meditate on the Word of God, and that you go before the Lord and ask Him to show you what those things are in your life that you need to put to death. Ask Him for the strength to do it. If you haven't asked Christ into your life, tonight's the night. Come to Him by faith. Yield to Him now. Ask Him into your life. You will discover the reality that Jesus Christ is alive if you'll seek Him with your whole heart and ask Him to show you. Get a Bible. Read. He will show himself to you. Wow. We have such a loving and good God. I trust that you'll serve him well. In church, seek the things that are above. Set your mind on the things that are above. This is the way to serve him well. God bless you.